Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to SK Science and Technology webinar. Uh, I'm Deep Medhi. I'm the organizer of this webinar series. And today I'm uh, very excited to have uh, Professor Alakawa Dutta from University of Missouri, sorry, University of Mississippi, Mississippi. <laughs> in USA. Uh, and he's going to talk about dark matter and particle physics. Uh, He's very much well connected back to Hassan. He will grow up uh, only a few, uh, I don't know, 100, maybe less than 100 years from me. Uh, but yeah. we uh, lost connection for a long time and, uh, and then reconnected more recently through Facebook. And then I kind of knew about his work and I thought uh, he's uh, doing some fascinating research and we're always curious about dark matter. It's becoming more of interest and uh, and some of you may remember that when I gave a talk on interdisciplinary science uh, last summer, there were people asking me questions about dark matter and particle physics type thing. I am not a physicist. So, so with that uh, basic intro, I'll uh, hand it over to Dr. Datta and, uh, and uh, maybe he can give with a bit of introduction about himself before he continues uh, with his uh, presentation. Yeah, Th thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to be here to give this talk. Um, and it's really good to be connected to kind of the place where I came from. Um, so as, as, <clears throat> as, Deep, uh, as Debo said, we, I, I grew up in, in Guwahati University and uh, you know, both our, our parents were a professor at the university. They were, I think, the earliest batch of professors uh, at the university. And then uh, I went to Don Bosco uh, school and then I did my pre-university in, in Cotton College. And, and from there, I went to um, a Presidency College in Calcutta where I did my undergraduate. And then I went to uh, the University of Delhi where I did my uh, master's. And I had uh, started uh, doing some work, uh, research work uh, in Delhi University uh, uh, with Professor uh, Mitra, uh, but after a couple of years, I, I went to a University of Hawaii, where I did my um, my PhD, and then you know in our field you have to do uh, like a few postdoc. I was at different places in the U.S. and Canada, and now I am uh, at the University of Mississippi, and uh, so I work in um, what is called uh, a theoretical particle physics. And uh, of course, uh, the most, uh, in our field now, the dark matter is the, the most important, one of the most important uh, subject of research, right? So, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of very fascinating subject. And uh, so it's, it's really uh, good to talk about it to, to, to not only to other fellow physicists, but you know, uh, to, to people in general. Okay. And so I have uh, uh, some slides and uh, the point is not for you to, uh, to and kind of go through all the slides because this subject is very vast. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I will show some slides. I, I will just point out some things and then you can, you're free to ask questions as, as Debo said, he's going to ask some clarifying questions. But the whole point is to just, you know, get you interested uh, in this subject, right? So. Uh, just just to know about the subject, there is a lot of good literature that you can you know uh, that, that you can study about this, um, and so just to have a, a Let general. Let me add interest something in quickly, Paloka, right. that uh, yeah. uh, anybody who has any questions, you can uh, use the chat to uh, start sure. typing it at any time. It, you know, these are informal way, and I call it a fireside chat format you know to to so you can ask questions at any point time uh, possible and uh, if you want to actually ask uh, through audio just uh, put a message to chat first so that we don't quite interrupt in the middle of what uh, dr doctor is talking about but we can actually accommodate even during the presentation we don't have to wait till the end of the presentation right yeah. so okay yeah exactly perfect so uh, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to just start with uh, the basic fact about the universe that we uh, that we live in and what we know about the universe here, right? 
And, um, and I think, I do not know if you have seen this uh, kind of what is called pie chart before. And so what, what we know today is that if you look at all the, the mass or the energy of the universe, it's actually split up in this way. And what we call ordinary matter, and what, by ordinary matter, we mean things that uh, we are made of or, or the sun or the stars or the galaxies that we see that are made of is only about 5%. Okay, so most of the universe, 95% of the universe is unknown. We do not know, okay. And, uh, and there is 26% of what is called the dark matter. And then there is about 69, 70% what is called the dark energy, okay. Now, um, what is the dark matter? Dark matter is, uh, is it's kind of, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the dark energy a little bit later. So a dark matter is matter just like, uh, uh, like the matter that we all know of, but it's extremely, extremely uh, uh, weakly interacting. So what is the meaning of weakly interacting? Uh, imagine, so suppose, you know, if, if you take your hand and hit it against the wall, you know, your hand doesn't go through the wall, right? And, and why is that? Uh, and the reason, the reason, the physics reason is, is that, uh, the atoms that that's in your hand and the atoms that are in the wall they are actually interacting so the fact that your hand doesn't go through the wall is because the stuff that you're made of actually interacts pretty strongly and and this force is something uh, we call the electromagnetic force actually so the electromagnetic force between the atoms in your hand and the atoms in the wall actually blocks your hand from going through okay now if the same thing were dark matter, then the dark matter would just right go through right through the wall, okay? Because there is very little interaction among the dark matter particles. So that's that's why it's called dark. Dark means, you know, it it doesn't interact at all. It's it's we call it it's very very weakly interacting, right? So and what, what, uh, uh, quick question here: What makes you think that? You can actually go through it, you know, in the first place. Well, because we know, because right now mm -hmm. we know there uh, there are billions of particles called the neutrinos that are just going right through us. Okay, and uh, I do not know if uh, you've heard. So there is this uh, a fundamental particle called neutrino, and the neutrino only has it's also very weakly interacting, and uh, there are billions of uh, neutrinos that are just going through us right now. Okay. And how do we know? Because we have actually detected this neutrino. So, uh, so in this house, in this room, I can have an experiment and I can detect the neutrino. One of the things that you should look at is the image of the sun uh, through neutrinos. Now we see the sun and the stars because they're emitting light, but more than light, they actually emit a huge amount of neutrinos that, that are emitted. And if you, look, if you look up Google, you will see the image of the sun seen through neutrinos. So if our eyes could see the neutrino, we could see the sun, okay? And so there is a picture of the sun using the neutrinos to see the sun. And, uh, and how do you detect the neutrinos? So when I was in, uh, in, in Hawaii, there was an experiment which was placed 16,000 feet uh, below the ocean, okay? And uh, you're 16,000 feet because the neutrinos that are coming from the top, they, I mean, there are a lot of stuff which are coming, right? So the water actually acts as a filter. But the important thing is you're actually uh, detecting neutrinos that is not coming from the top, it's coming from the other side of the earth. So the neutrinos which are hitting the other side of the earth go through the earth and then they hit the detector. So we know, uh, we know that uh, these, these neutrinos are going right through the matter because we have actually detected them in experiment. So uh -huh. you can see what are called upward coming neutrinos and downward coming neutrinos. Mm -hmm. So right now for me, it's night. Now, if I have a telescope or, or a neutrino experiment, I can actually look at the earth because I can actually look at the sun because the neutrinos that are coming, uh, so now the sun is on the other side but the neutrinos can go right through the earth and they can come and hit my detector. I can actually see the sun, okay, at night. And that's how the picture of the sun was taken at night in one of this experiment where the neutrinos were coming from the other side. And there is a picture, you should look up, that's, it's a very famous picture. 
the picture of the of the sun as seen by neutrinos. Okay, so neutrinos is one kind of uh, very weakly interacting particle, and the dark matter is the closest to a neutrino. In fact, one of the models of of dark matter is that it is some kind of cousin of the neutrino. Right, and so that's why it's kind of very. Um, that's why particle physics. Uh, so when I talk about the particle physics, I will talk about the weak force. And this weak force is the force of radioactivity. And that's very weak. And so the dark matter are very, very weakly interacting, right? So they're very weakly interacting. Now, how do we, I mean, if we want to kind of uh, describe them in terms of simple physics, you can um, describe them in terms of pressure, right? So for instance, you know, we know that you know, we have got pressure, we have got atmospheric pressure, right? So if you have a bunch of atoms or molecules, they exert pressure. So for instance, if you put a bunch of uh, atoms in a container, there is a pressure because the, the molecules are hitting the walls of the, the container and they exert a force, okay? Now, if you were having a dark matter and if you put them in a container, this dark matter is going to hit the wall and just go through it, okay? So they exert no pressure. So in, in, in cosmology, we represent mm -hmm. this, this kind of uh, different kind of uh, matter by what is the pressure, right? So for a dark matter, the pressure is zero. So it, they, you know, because if, if you are right now, you're surrounded by dark matter. Okay, we haven't detected dark matter on earth. We know that there are neutrinos and right now there is a dark matter all around you, but they don't exert any pressure because they are going right through you. Now you're surrounded by air molecules and all, and so they are exerting pressure on you, but the dark matter and neutrino, they're exerting no pressure. So you don't feel anything because mm -hmm. everything is just going right through. Right? Very interesting that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't know where those the, the neutrinos are coming from too. I mean, oh, the so neutrinos come because the, so anytime mm -hmm. there is a nuclear reaction, you know, mm -hmm. uh, neutrinos are produced. Uh -huh. So all the right. reactors, so, when we do, where are the neutrinos coming from? They are coming from the stars. They are coming from the sun, okay? So when you talk about neutrinos, people will talk about solar neutrinos. So solar right. neutrinos are coming mm -hmm. from the sun. People call atmospheric neutrinos. So we know that we are constantly bombarded by all kinds of radiation which are coming from distant galaxies. Those are called cosmic rays. So when these cosmic rays come and they hit the upper atmosphere, they produce neutrinos. Those are atmospheric neutrinos. Yeah. If you go near a nuclear reactor, a whole bunch of neutrinos are being produced. So these are yeah. called reactor neutrinos. Now, what I meant by you don't know where it comes from is that specifically related to cosmic neutrinos, where exactly it is coming from. We know it is it coming from. Yes. Yeah, that's, so yeah, so that's, that's what I was trying to refer to. Ex exactly. Because so, I'm familiar with the ice cube experiment. So exactly, no. exactly. So, you yeah. know about the ice cube. So you well, see in because ice Because I know who is doing it, so that's why I know. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the ice cube is uh, is an experiment that is put in the uh, in the South Pole. So it's it's got a it's uh, it's put about a, a kilometer or so under the ice. And so again, you're looking for two kinds of neutrinos, neutrinos which are coming from the, uh, from the top and neutrinos coming from the other side of the, so. And one of the things is to really find out where, what is, as, as uh, they were said, where, where exactly is, is the source of this uh, neutrinos. Uh, so the, the history of neutrinos is actually absolutely fascinating. So, mm -hmm. and so one of the, things about particle physics is what is particle physics? Particle physics is, you know, we are just trying to understand what are the basic building blocks of, of this universe, right? And uh, that's what we do. And so that means, you know, what is everything? What are you made of at the fundamental level? What is the chair, the table, the, the computer that you're, that you're looking at at the fundamental level? What are the building blocks? That is particle physics, right? And uh, it is uh, for me a little bit, at least in here, I see very people are, you know, a little bit less inter interested in knowing this, right? But it should be because that's, that's you know, that's what we do. So, and, and the history of particle physics has been very, very, very interesting because there are a lot of stories, a lot of mysteries, and you know, how people finally figured out what is really going on. So it's a fascinating. So for instance, this neutrinos, you know, you will find that, you know, you can give uh, like a two hour talk on neutrinos, 
how it was first discovered, why what it was proposed and how it was actually. So it's a beautiful uh, example of experimental work because it's so weakly detect, uh, uh, so weakly, they interact so weakly. So it took it like 30 to 40 years before it was proposed to actually observe it because it, there had to be a lot of technological advances to actually detect the neutrino, right? So. Yeah, the, uh, I want to quickly add something that uh, as is a technological advancement, right. what is very important is that to do good science or to do the next generation of science, the instrumentation is, has become extremely important. You know, right. I mean, it has always been important going back to Millikan's experiment, you know, <laughs> but it right. has, it, you know, it has become more and more about new things that we try right. to, you know, find. So. So uh, here's, I have a quick question already. Yeah. Are neutri neutrinos dark matter? You sort of touched on it earlier. Maybe somebody right. joined soon so, so uh, right now. So can you explain that again? Mm -hmm. So the neutrinos that we have observed is not dark matter, okay? Because, uh, uh, because it doesn't fit, I mean. So there is, a, there is a, as I said, a cousin of, so there can be a slightly different variety of, uh, neutrino, which is a possible candidate for dark matter. So the problem is we do not know what exactly is dark matter. So one of the candidate is a neutrino, but not the neutrinos that is coming from the sun or not. It's, 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 it's somewhat different, right? Mm. Because uh, what is called a dark matter is it's complete. We'll see, I mean, um, like we know, we, we know about electricity, right? So everyone knows about electricity. So electricity mm. happens because, you know, like particles, like the electrons, they have something called a charge. So because they have electric charge, so they can, you know, they can uh, take place, they can, you know, be involved in electro electric phenomena, right? So that's, uh, uh, so the so fundamental particles have charged. For instance, the electron has uh, an electric charge as a result of which, you know, there is electricity or there are electric fields and, you know, electromagnetic fields and so on. Uh, there are also uh, like, you know, we have the proton in the nucleus. So they have a different charge. They have a strong charge, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, because of that, they, they produce strong force. So, they, you know, they interact with each other to the strong force. And then the object like electron also has a weak charge, which uh, we'll talk about. And so they can be involved in radioactive uh, processes, right? A dark matter is something which has no charge, right? So, so the neutrino that we know of still has a charge. It has what is called a weak charge. So it, it takes play, part in, in a weak interaction, but the dark matter is even more feebly, uh, interacts even more weakly than the neutrino. And so the neutrino that we have observed is not uh, a dark matter, but as I said, when you talk about neutrino, there turns out to be what is called a right-handed neutrino, which can be a dark matter, but you know, it's a possibility. So one of the simplest, ex uh, uh, one of the simplest example of dark matter is a neutrino, but it's a, it's a right-handed neutrino. I'll, 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 it's, it's, I'll talk a little bit about that. I know it's uh, too much stuff, but you know, but that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a valid question. And yes, a neutrino can be a dark matter, right? But, slightly different version of the neutrino. Okay. I don't know if you have heard about the dark energy, but this is something very, very, uh, very interesting. Dark energy is basically energy of the vacuum, right? We, uh, you know, one of the things when we do particle physics is we, we have to deal with the very small, okay? And, uh, and when we deal with the atoms or, you know, if we deal with the, the, the proton and inside the proton are kind of quarks, because these become very small, then we have to use the laws of quantum mechanics, okay? And, and so in, in quantum mechanics, very, very strange thing happen because it's not strange because um, things happen which does not make sense to us. Now, you know, we, we all, often talk, you know, oh, this is obvious, this is common sense. Our common sense is derived from our experience in the real world. And we are all macroscopic objects. We are not microscopic objects. So when things become large, like, you know, ourselves or the planets and all, so those are, uh, those are explained by what is called classical physics. 
But those same rules do not apply when you go to the very small uh, particles. So then uh, you get what is called, you have to use what quantum mechanics, right? And, uh, and then, you know, a lot of things happen that doesn't make sense to you based on your, uh, your experience in life because in life you are dealing with a big object, macroscopic objects. You're not really dealing with microscopic objects. And uh, one of the things that you learn from uh, quantum mechanics is there is nothing called nothing. One of the things that uh, scientists will be asked is that, you know, you said there was a big bang, you know, how can things come from nothing? So we always have this idea that first there must be nothing, then you put something. But quantum mechanics says that nothing doesn't exist. So, so suppose you, you take uh, a, 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 like a box and put stuff and try to get everything out of it, okay? And then at some point you will say that there is a vacuum. So that means there is nothing. But in quantum mechanics, it says that, you know, you can never reach that point of zero energy that doesn't exist because there is something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which allows some energy to be produced out of nothing. Okay. So this dark energy is actually the energy of the vacuum. So if you don't have anything, still there is some energy and, uh, Einstein called it the, uh, is the, called the, the cosmological constant. So there is a very uh, uh, interesting story about it because when Einstein uh, wrote down his theory of gravity, at the, he found that his theory predicted that the universe is expanding, okay? Now, I think most of you know that we believe now the universe is expanding because of the big bang, right? So uh, the universe began with a kind of big, uh, explosion. And now if you look at the galaxies, you will find that the galaxies are moving away from each other, right? Now, when Einstein wrote his equation, he found that his equation was predicting that, you know, the universe is expanding. At, a, at the time, that was not the case. People believe that, you know, every, all the galaxies are fixed in space. And so he thought, okay, my, my, you know, my equations are wrong. So he introduced a vacuum energy in his equation to stop that expansion. And then when Hubble in the 1960s or 70s discovered that you know, the, the universe is expanding, then Einstein realized, oh my God, I had the perfect equation. It was predicting that the, the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. So he called it the biggest blunder of his life. So he mm -hmm. took away the you know, cosmological vacuum energy. In the 1990s, there was a new experiment which actually showed that the universe is not only expanding, it is expanding at an accelerating rate. People thought before that the universe is expanding at a constant rate, but now they found that it's actually expanding, uh, at, it's accelerating. And so now they had to introduce the cosmological constant again, so that's the vacuum energy, okay? So this is a, a completely dark subject. No one knows. If you solve what is, what is you know, how to calculate, there is a mechanism uh, from quantum mechanics which tells us how to calculate the vacuum energy. But the problem is if you go and calculate it, it doesn't match with the experiment. So this okay. is the biggest challenge. So if you solve this problem, forget about winning the Nobel Prize. You will be another person as famous as Einstein. This is, you know, this is a very, very difficult problem. So there is an energy of vacuum that is causing this. And so there are many theories. I think before we solve the dark energy problem, we'll definitely solve the dark matter problem because okay. this is this. But there is, there is an energy of the vacuum that, you know, and I can actually post uh, some very, very good uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos for general person, uh, people. Be great. Okay. Yeah, there is one uh, which says we all came out of nothing. It's uh, by a gentleman called Khalili, who is a physicist in Southampton. Southampton in, uh, it's a beautiful. So how, how, you know, how we learn about the vacuum, what is the vacuum? So it, it actually, you know, goes into philosophy and all, I mean. Of course. You know, yeah. what, what is, how, how, what is the vacuum? What is nothing? There's, you know, there is nothing called nothing. You can never produce, uh, produce nothing. In, uh, so, so that's. Uh, uh, there's one question again, now back yeah. to uh, right. uh, the dark matter. Right. That um, are neutrino candidate for dark matter different mm -hmm. from now known neutrinos? Very interesting question. 
Okay, so uh, so let me uh, just uh, go to the. Uh, uh, okay, so the need. Uh, so the or you can come back to that uh, later if you no, want. To uh, to okay, so play. let me uh, let me explain, and, and maybe it's it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, um, maybe a little bit technical, but this is uh, so it is connected to the Higgs. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so yep. it turns out. Uh, very interestingly is that when we write our theories, it turns out that mathematically, um, so, okay, you know, um, let's take uh, uh, the, the fundamental particle that we all know of, that's uh, the electron, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out, and we do not know this, is actually two kinds of electrons, okay? And, um, most people think of there is just an electron. It's actually two kinds of electron. And for some technical reason, we call them left and it's called them right. We call them left. You can think of this as one electron is kind of spinning in one direction. The other electron you can think is spinning in, in a different direction. So one is spinning in clockwise direction. One is spinning in the anti-clockwise direction, right? Uh, so to have, it turns out that any object that has mass, like an electron comes in two varieties. It can be in left or it can be right, okay? So the neutrinos were uh, considered to be massless, but one of the things that you will know from uh, research is that very recently there were this experiment in, in Canada and experiment in Japan where they actually found the neutrinos also have masses, okay? So, um, so again, so that means the neutrino must also come in two varieties. One, when it's spinning in one direction and spinning in another direction. One is called the left and one is called the right. The neutrinos okay. that are coming from the left, uh, are coming from the sun and the stars are the left-handed type, okay? I see, okay. Mm -hmm. And the right-handed ones can be dark matter. I see, very interesting. Okay. So, uh, the, the, so the right-handed so, neutrinos are the dark matter. I see, okay. Yeah. Right. So that's spinning in in opposite direction. Then mm -hmm. the neutron. So the 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 it turns out that when we have all these nuclear reactions going on in the sun, they only produce the the left-handed neutrinos. And there was this uh, big big discovery. Uh, so left and right has to be symmetric. If you believe in a like what is called a symmetry between the left and right, then if there is a left, there is also a right. Right. And uh, because the neutrinos were produced only in the left, it was the, you will, sometimes you will read, it was the, a big discovery that the parity is not conserved. So right. what it re really means, you know, is that uh, if I look into the mirror, so parity symmetry is that what you see in the mirror is exactly the same as what I am. Correct. But if mm -hmm. you include all the weak processes or the radioactive process, there are a very small amount of radioactive processes going in your body. So what you see in the mirror, the person is not exactly the same as you. They're a little bit different. And all the processes that involve the neutrinos in our body are different in the mirror than you are. So you're not uh -huh. exactly seeing 100% yeah. the same person. <laughs> so it's not paradisimetric, right? Okay. So, uh, all right, there is one more question going back to your expansion of the universe uh, thing right. that you mentioned. Yeah. Okay, let me read it, the question. The current vacuum yeah. density is very low. Then yeah. how dark energy expanded the universe in, in inflationary way against tremendous gravity force? Actually, you know, um, there is a, a very misconception that gravity is strong. Gravity is... Uh, just to tell you how gravity is, um, you now if you, you know, you have a table, right? Mm -hmm. So if you put, for instance, right now I have my phone on the table, right? Now this phone is being attracted by the earth because gravity is, you know, our earth is pulling it. Look at the size of the earth, huge, right? So, so the question is, why is the, my phone not falling through the table and going towards the center of the earth? What is preventing it from going? And the answer is again, the electric forces. So the table is exerting a force which is called the normal force. And this force is electromagnetic. It's because the atoms mm -hmm. uh, that are in my phone and the atoms that are in the uh, table 
So they are producing a force which balances the world. So gravity is the weakest force uh, mm -hmm. in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so you can, uh, so, you know, even with a small, so the, the, the question is very good. So the, the dark energy is very small, it's, you know, but it still, still cause a huge expansion, right? Compared so to the gravity, the other, I mean, yeah, the other. Compared to the gravity. Yeah, it's right. always so a, it's it. a matter of scale, what order of magnitude, yep, yes, okay, right. very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. So, you know, I see that people already know a lot about inflation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there are uh, <laughs> teachers and students in this call right. too. So, so another yeah. one, before you go to the next slide, uh, right. as dark meters are 100% transparent, how is it possible to detect true dark matter experimentally very good so we'll we'll come to we'll come to, we'll come so to what that happens, so uh, what happens is there are two ways uh, there are three ways of detecting dark matter okay one is uh, uh, and so so let me uh, let me talk a little bit about the dark matter and then we'll talk about detection actually i think that'll be good if you can cover yeah. through that your so, next slide right, so, we'll, okay. so so one of, so how do we know that there was dark matter? And so dark matter, uh, there were, if you go do a literature search, they will point to five uh, experimental evidence of dark matter. So I have just picked uh, two and, uh, and this is uh, one. So what happens here you see is that you have a galaxy here, right? And if you believe in uh, uh, Newton's gravity, what it tells you is that, so most of the mass that you see is concentrated at, at the center of the galaxy, okay? And then from uh, simple ideas of, uh, you know, Newton's law of gravitation, it tells you that if you're looking at a star, which is away from the center of the galaxy, its velocity should follow, uh, it, there is a simple, I put an equation here, that's the only equation I have. So you see, it depends on the distance r, which is the distance from the center. So the further away you are from the center of the galaxy, this velocity of the star should be small, okay? And so that is, uh, if you look at the curve, that's the curve that is predicted that as you go to larger, larger distances, the velocity is small. But when they went and actually did the measurement, they found that the velocity, instead of uh, falling as going down, as you increase the distance from the center of the galaxy, it was actually going up. So here you see the data points, okay? And so that's uh, very interesting. That's contradictory right. in a sense. It's completely. So, so if, you, if you look at you know, um, ordinary matter, these are all the ordinary matter that you see. These are the all the ordinary matter that you know, cosmologists or astrophysicists are detecting. And so they are saying that, okay, then th this is not happening. What is happening? So the model now we have is, is of this. So this is our galaxy here. And it's actually embedded in this whole huge, a halo of dark matter. So there is dark matter oh, all I over see. the place. Okay. So this is this is the picture. That's that's mm -hmm. that's the that's the dark matter that mm -hmm. you have. So mm -hmm. what we see is only this, but there is all this stuff around here, right? So there is the and, and it's not drawn to scale. For instance, this this amount is huge. We are just putting it in this figure to see this. But there is all this dark matter halos or something, right? Um, the other, other result of dark matter is uh, what is called the bullet cluster, okay? Now I said that, so one of the questions that was asked is how do you know uh, that, you know, this dark matter can go through each other, right? Uh, so dark matter is very weakly interacting. So for instance, if you have, you know, a, a collision of two cars, you know, if you have two regular cars, they collide, they're going to produce a big mass. But if, if these cars are made, made of dark matter, they're going to go right through them right through each other, okay? So this was called the bullet cluster. So there were two galaxies who collided, okay? Now, if they were ordinary matter, it would produce a big, big mess, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you look at, after the collision, if you look at, and I, I'll try to play a video here. If you look at the collision, it looks like when they collided, most of the matter just went right through it. I and see, so here, here is all mm -hmm. the matter, which is the visible matter. And this blue ma matter is the dark matter. So most of the matter of the galaxy is not at the center. It's all as if they just went through each other. Interesting. So this is, it, mm -hmm. it cannot happen with ordinary matter. Mm -hmm. Of course I not, mean, so yeah. 
you can make a simulation. So, you know, the, the astrophysicists, they make a simulation. Okay, if, if I have two galaxies colliding, I can predict what's going to happen, how the matter was going. This is not what you get. Mm -hmm. So to get this, you have to see as if the, the object just went through each other. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can, uh, I can link to this and uh, I cannot, but uh, so there, there is a, uh, uh, let's see, my, my sharing screen stop. Let me try again. So there is a video which uh, you can actually look at. You should you should look at this the video, which actually um, um, there is a link. So no, it is it's not taking me to the link. Okay. So you should look at this. So you see th there is a simulation of the two galaxies colliding and you will see that they are just passing through each other, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that is another, uh, um, so we know that these galaxies are made of something which is not like ordinary matter because ordinary matter would not mm -hmm. produce this this kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, collision. And so that's, that's another evidence. So there are other evidence uh, like, you know, I, I do not know because there is, um, if, if you know of this, that if you, if you look in the sky, there is a, a radiation which is called the microwave radiation, right? And it's a radiation which is from the Big Bang, right? And it's still there. And it has a temperature, very low temperature of three degrees Kelvin, which is like minus 270 degrees uh, centigrade. And if you study, so people have detected that, uh, that that too, there is a famous history. So, so they are in the microwave region. So this, this radiation is in the microwave region. And the people who discovered it, they were work, working for some, some lab, I don't know, Bell Labs or something. So they were doing some radio astronomy and they find a signal in their, in their you know, detector. And they are trying to find out where the signal is coming from. So they thought that you know, in their antenna, maybe the birds had, you know, <laughs> had uh, you mm -hmm. know, poo, so <laughs> they were cleaning up. Maybe, you know, there is some interference going on. And they finally clean everything, but still there is a, a mysterious signal coming. And then someone read, okay, that, this was a prediction of Big Bang that, you know, uh, this radiation, which was there during the Big Bang now, because of the expansion of the universe, it has really cooled down and it should be there everywhere. And it's there. So you can actually see the microwave radiation. And now this microwave radiation is, uh, is, it has been studied. Uh, and from the structure of the microwave radiation, so basically uh, it's supposed to be a fixed temperature, but it's, there is slight uh, fluctuations in this temperature. And from the slight fluctuations, you, it, it tells you that there has to be dark matter because the temperature fluctuations that you see of the radiation cannot be explained by ordinary matter. So that's also another yeah, very, very compelling evidence for, for dark matter, right? So. Your slide is not showing up now, if you see. If, uh, oh, it's, it's not showing up? Yep. Mm -hmm. When you went, try to do the video. Okay. Um, uh, so let me see, I was, I thought I was sharing, let me. Uh, let's go. Okay. So I stop share, let me sh share screen again. Let me know if it's there. Okay, uh, go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, let me see. Oh, where's my... Okay, I think it uh, took me to... Let's see, where am I? So should... Uh... To show my screen. Okay, let me try again. How oh, come I can see it? Oh. Yeah, now your desktop is showing up. Yeah, it's my desktop is showing. But, uh, okay. <laughs> About a drag it or something. Right. Uh, let's stop. 
where is my button? Should, uh, uh, let me see. I put too much stuff on my desktop. Okay, here it is. Yeah, when I clicked it, I should be there. Yeah, here. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's uh, uh, so, so when you yeah. go to the screen view, it disappears. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So stay stay with the uh, regular view. Okay. At okay. least that way we can see what you have. Just okay. forward it. Mm. Can you see it now? Yep. Now I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So okay. <laughs> okay. It's okay. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, so this was the. Um, so you should you should look at this video because it actually shows that you know these things are mm -hmm. just going through each other and and so we believe that so one of the the reason is that we don't understand first of all why uh, there should be matter right i mean in nature uh, it doesn't produce things which are not not i mean not useless you know i mean our experience is that if there is something there is a reason why it exists right and you know, people, you know, it, it's not that something happened just for some reason. So the, because the dark matter is there, it tells us not only we need to find out what it is, we need to find out why it is there, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. vacuum energy we can understand because, you know, the dark energy, we know that vacuum has energy, it's a matter of calculating. But why should be, why should there be dark matter? What is the reason, okay? And I think it's, it's connected, most people believe that it is connected to, uh, what is called the standard model of particle physics. So what we understand today, uh, what are the fundamental building blocks of matter is uh, encoded in this uh, theory, which is called the standard model. It turns out that the predictions of this model, this, this is, the, is the most successful model ever uh, constructed by humans. And it's most successful because there are predictions of this model which agree up to, I don't know, 15 or 16 decimal places, which means that, you know, you, I make a prediction that this will be one point something, 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 you go do an experiment and you find exactly that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the amount of precision that we get is, is remarkable. Mm -hmm. But it is not a good theory because there are, first of all, if, if I look at this, uh, uh, and I, I will kind of talk about this, there are uh, many particles, too many particles, and uh, there are, a whole bunch of problems here. And so I'm going to kind of just uh, uh, kind of tell you about this. Again, there is too much stuff, uh, but you know, that's, that's what we kind of know here. And I, I want to uh, kind of uh, focus on what is called the, the Higgs boson, which was uh, the big news in, in 2012, where it was uh, uh, dis discussed uh, just a minute. <laughs> So um, let's see. So, um, uh, so I want to just uh, point out to some patterns here. You see that there are three lines mm -hmm. and these three lines uh, are called three families, okay? And pretty much, uh, uh, just a minute, I will just. <laughs> model has a lot of mystery. So all the stuff that we see around us today, all the stuff that's in the universe are pretty much made out of all these particles in the first group. Okay. So uh, what is called, so this, uh, this, uh, the, the orange color object 
are what are called quarks. So these are the, the objects that make up, for instance, the proton. So if you know in an atom, there is a nucleus, there are protons, if you've learned your chemistry. So these are the ones that uh, make up the protons and they, they interact with uh, each other. They also have charges like electric charges. So they produce electric fields, but they also have what is called a different kind of charge. And we just gave it a name color. Doesn't mean that they are actually colored that way because it's like an electric charge, but it's a different kind of force. And so that allows them to be bound inside the proton. So if, if you uh, break up a proton, it's going to be made out of this quark. So inside the proton are quarks. So the, the proton, for instance, is not a fundamental. So a proton is like um, a nucleus of a hydrogen atom, right? So that's, that's the proton. And it's made out of this up quarks. And so there is a certain grouping. So they, they fall in this group here. And then uh, these objects are called uh, uh, quarks. And then there is the electron, the electron that we all know about. So you know, everyone knows about the electron. And associated with this electron is this neutrino, which means that in any reactor, whenever uh, an electron is produced, it's always associated with a neutrino, right? And it's, it's a special kind of neutrino because it's always associated with the electron and it's called the, uh, the electron type neutrino, okay? As far as the universe is concerned, that's all we need, okay? These are all we need. But then when we did experiment, we started discovering that there were two other families and people were so mad. One of the famous scientists, uh, Robbie, he said, who ordered them? We don't need them, why are they there? So it's one of the big problems is that, you know, our universe would be fine with this, but there are all these particles here, okay? We know that there are three families. And, and one of the big question is why, why is, are there three families, okay? And so difference between them is these particles are all stable, which means, you know, uh, they are there. Uh, but these particles, which are, which are exactly, for instance, if you look at the, uh, the first line here, it's called the up quark, the charm quark and top quark. They look exactly the same. The top looks exactly the same as the charm, exactly look as up. The only difference is that their masses are different, but all their forces, all their charges, they're exactly the same, okay? And, uh, and actually um, when, the energy, when, when they have very high energies, you would actually produce the top quark, but these quarks are unstable. So after some time, the top is, top is going to decay into other quarks. So it, it decays, may, maybe decay here, it can decay here. And finally, they all end up in this first family. So in experiments like the LHC or other experiments, we actually, so these are objects that you won't find in your you know, day-to-day -day life. But if you go to big accelerators like uh, the Large Hadron Collider, you actually produce a lot of this, uh, this particle. And then you observe that they quickly decay into the first generation. The same thing happens for, for the electron. There is a particle called the muon and the muon you can actually see on earth. I mean, in, in, a, uh, in a lab because they are produced in the atmosphere. Again, it's exactly like the electron, but it has a, 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 a little more mass than the electron. And if you produce a, a muon, it will quickly uh, decay, uh, break apart and uh, change into an electron. Similarly, there is uh, this uh, two, two families, okay? So one of the biggest mysteries is that we still don't understand is it's something that I work on a lot is that uh, why are there two families? And so people, you know, uh, again, there is a story, I think some people were having ice cream. And so they called it, uh, they were trying out different flavors of ice cream. So this, these are, these are called different flavors. So, you know, so that's why you call this the up flavor, just like ice cream. This is a charm flavor and top flavor. So these are different flavors. So this whole branch of physics, particle physics, trying to understand why there are, you know, these three families, it's called flavor physics. So we want to understand this. So these are the objects that make us uh, the matter particle, okay? So that's all the stuff that we are made of. So if you, if you look at the atom inside, there is an electron and then there is a proton and the proton is made out of up quark and down quark, okay? And then there is this, this particles. These are the particles which are responsible for forces. For instance, you know, if you have two electrons, uh, they interact with each other. And how do they interact? It turns out that they interact, and I will show you a picture here. 
they interact by, um, this is the Higgs boson. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Here is uh, two electrons here, and there is a force between them. For instance, if you take two magnets, you know, if you try to bring two magnets together, if they are facing North Pole, they are going to repel, right? So what is causing the force, okay? And we try to understand this force uh, by saying that, you know, this electron is, these two electrons are exchanging a new kind of particle. These are called bosonic particle after Bose, S and Bose, and they are the force carriers. So this is a photon. So uh, the force between two magnets is because the magnets are exchanging uh, these photons and that, that photon can cause attraction or repulsion. Okay. So we, we uh, divide our particles into particles, uh, which are called matter particles, like the electrons, which make the atom and their force particles. The, the, the matter particles are exchanging these force particles, which produces the force. And so uh, if you look back, um, uh, so these are the, the, the three forces. So when particles exchange a photon, that produces the electromagnetic force. When they exchange this particle called the gluon, it produces the strong force. And when it exchanges what is called the Z boson and the W boson, it produces what is called the weak force, okay? Uh, the, uh, the electrons uh, uh, only have the, the strong force, uh, the, the, the electromagnetic force and the weak force, the quarks have all kinds of forces. They can have uh, all three kinds of forces. The neutrinos only have the weak force, okay? So they, they only take place, they only uh, participate in the weak force. This mysterious thing is the Higgs boson, right? What is the Higgs boson? Uh, again, it can be a, a two hour talk on Higgs boson. It turns out that what we now think the Higgs boson is, it's our window to the dark matter world. So all these particles that the ordinary particles that we talk about interacts with the dark matter through the exchange of the, of the Higgs boson. So it's called a window, it's called a portal. So the Higgs boson is our window to the dark matter. All matter particles that, are, that make up this visible universe interact with the dark matter world through this Higgs force, okay? So that's, that's what what is one of the popular models is. So mm -hmm. very interesting. Higgs is, a, is, mm -hmm. is the window to our dark matter. So particle physics is, is, is connected to, uh, mm -hmm. connect to this uh, dark matter thing. So uh, anyway, so know, let's, I, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, we are kind of getting closer to an hour. Right. So I'm right. very conscious about your time also. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. So, you know, so we can go a little bit longer to clarify. And, right, no, no, that, that's yeah. fine. But there's, so, a question, um, there's a question here. Let me read sure. that question to you. Right, yeah. Are all the hidden forces behind this visible existent is dark matter? If no, then what must be the parameters? And if we don't know the exact parameter, does it work? To define it as a something like dark matter, and so so I would like to I would love to know the possible parameters those might be uh, responsible for expanding the universe. It's a very interesting question, actually. Yeah. So right now we know that dark matter is necessary for uh, to explain the, the the all the observations that we make. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, the microwave or the expansion rate, what is called the Hubble constant. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need we, because a lot of um, uh, this thing, uh, astrophysical uh, observations only depend on the, the gravitational interaction mostly. So we know that there is some extra matter, which is not the ordinary matter. There is dark matter, it has gravitational interactions. We, we do not know. So we, we roughly have an idea, the parameters that we know about it is we roughly have an idea of how much it is. We know that it's very weakly interacting because they just kind of pass through each other. That's what we see in evidence, but we still don't know what, what it is, okay? The answer is that th the model that I showed here before, this, uh, 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 this model with the standard model of particle physics has a whole bunch of problems. And so people have uh, proposed many models which uh, go beyond the standard model. And many of these models actually have a candidate of dark matter, OK? 
Okay. So one of the famous model that uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider was looking for, but they didn't find it was what was called supersymmetry. So there is, there is a particle uh, which is dark matter. So, uh, so, they, so if, if uh, for instance, if the Large Hadron Collider had formed supersymmetry, we would know what the dark matter is because there is a prediction. So if he had predicted, if he had confirmed that supersymmetry is, is a correct description of nature, then we know what the dark matter is. But right now there are many, 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 uh, what are called extensions of this standard model. And we are all trying to find out, you know, what exactly is the dark matter? So that's an open question. Now, there are, uh, there are many experiments uh, that, uh, and let me go to the slide. So uh, let me explain that, I, I will go to this. Then I'll try to explain this uh, slide here. Uh, uh, one of the things that I do not know if, uh, I want to just make one, one point here, is that we know that um, every particle has an antiparticle, right? Uh, for, for instance, an antiparticle is an object which has exactly the same charge as that particle, just the opposite charge of that particle, but everything else is the same. It has the same mass. So for instance, uh, an electron has an antiparticle called positron. And it was discovered in the 1930s uh, by a person named Paul Dirac. He actually wrote down an equation for the electron. And he found that his uh, equations were predicting another particle, which had exactly the same, char uh, same mass, but opposite charge. So he actually made a prediction there should be an antiparticle. Uh, what is very curious about the antiparticle is that if a particle and an antiparticle uh, come together, then they both disappear into pure energy, okay? And so that's what we use in, in, in experiments like colliders, right? So what you do is you, you create a particle and you create an antiparticle and you collide them. When you collide them, they, this particle disappear into pure energy. This energy is carried out, for instance, here, for instance, the photon. And from that Einstein's famous equation, E equal to MC squared, which means that you can take energy and create matter, you actually produce different kinds of matter. So that's what, you know, the colliders work. They, they get particle, antiparticle, they, they collide, it turns into energy, and then this energy is used to produce this new kinds of particles. So we can produce the Higgs, we can produce the top quark, all, all this kind of thing, okay? Um, so, so that's, uh, that's what we do. So mm -hmm. I wanted to mention this because I'm going to go uh, and look at, so this is what we were saying. So this is what this represents here is a dark matter uh, comes in and a dark matter is interacting with the visible world. So this is our visible world. This is the dark matter world and the Higgs is the window. So if right. you're, a, if you're, if you're a ordinary person, you have to look into the dark matter world and you can only look through the Higgs portal or the Higgs window. And so the Higgs is uh, producing this force between the dark matter and us. Okay, mm -hmm. so 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 then the question there is an interesting question that so the, is there any possibility of dark matter be getting converted to ordinary matter exactly. po potentially through this window, right? So exactly, you 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 already huh? got my answer. <laughs> well, I mean, it's so, not me; it's somebody asked the question. So okay, whatever. I'm sounding intelligent it, here. So exactly. But, so what happens? One of the way of detecting is that. As I showed in, in the galaxy, there is a lot of dark matter, right? Mm -hmm. So a dark matter can combine together mm -hmm. and be converted into ordinary matter, right? So right. this through this, so that this dark matter come in, they exchange through this Higgs and they produce ordinary matter. So can so it go reverse see, then the second question then? The same person said it, it, like, it can goes, it go the other direction? It, that something can, which is can. visible and becomes- that's exactly, <laughs> Okay, so I, I should, I should, this is exactly the plot, okay? Yeah. So X is the dark matter, okay? So you look at it in different ways, okay? Mm -hmm. So in the galaxy, the dark matter is colliding and turning into ordinary matter. So here the dark matter comes, dark matter comes, there is a Higgs somewhere here, it mm -hmm. produces ordinary matter, right? Mm -hmm. And we see that ordinary matter in terms of, for instance, uh, often it's seen from the center of galaxies, there are very strong X-rays coming or gamma rays coming, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is, coming because the dark matter have converted into ordinary matter. That's one way of actually detecting dark matter. So that's called indirect detection, okay? Mm -hmm. 
You can have the opposite. That's why I showed you the collider. Now you go this right. way. The standard model comes in, standard model comes in and produces dark matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you will see, the signal is uh, remarkable. You see two matter comes in, okay. You produce energy and then you see nothing. So you have got two, uh, you know, two particles coming in because dark matter, you know, it, it's not detected, right? Because the dark matter doesn't decay or something. So suddenly you produce all this energy and you expect this energy to be converted into something and it gets converted into dark matter. But because you cannot see dark matter, what is called is a missing energy. So they see imbalance. They see all this energy coming in mm -hmm. and then that disappears, right? So energy cannot disappear, which means the energy went and produced this dark matter. So in experiments like LHC, where you take ordinary matter, you collide them, you produce dark matter, that's another way of finding it. So that's mm -hmm. what is called the production here, which is in, in a detector like LHC, they are actually producing dark matter and they're trying to detect it, okay? Uh, UC is indirect. So, so the, indirect the, the, I mean, yeah. thinking out uh, really far, far away from now, yeah. essentially yeah. what we, if, if they are going bi-directional, goes from one right. to the other, that right. it is possible to then think about in the future that you can actually be, build an instrumentation that mm. can to potentially convert it from one side to the other side. They are, yeah. And, and so, yeah. and that changes the entire universe in a sense, because if suddenly, for example, especially knowing that we have more dark matter, in right. the universe that you can actually right. convert back to energy. Right. And it's say, yeah. it really solves a huge energy problem for the earth, for example, correct? That, that, I mean, that, that, I mean that, that won't happen in the next few years, no. but that's the long-term goal of understanding why this matters, the whole field of understanding this problem. Exactly, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, exactly, that's exactly. I mean, there are a lot of technological things that could happen, <laughs> I mean, you can convert it. As I said, right now we are surrounded by dark matter, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can in principle convert them to, you know, and, and these are the energy of the universe. They, they have energies, they are moving at, uh, their speed is around 300 kilometers per second. So these are all around us, right? <laughs> so you can, you can convert it, right? Uh, the other uh, experiment that is actually done on Earth mm -hmm. is, is this way. So a dark matter which is surrounding you, it comes and it hits an atom, right? It hits mm -hmm. a standard model particle and it produces a recoil. So the experiment is you, you have an atom, it's, it's just still, and suddenly it starts moving without seeing anything, right? Because the dark matter, you cannot detect it, right? So you suddenly see that an atom which was still just recoils, just moves. Mm -hmm. And by observing how it moves, at what angle it moves, you can actually tell what kind of matter it got, uh, what kind of dark matter hit it, what was the mass of the dark matter. So you can learn a lot of, so by doing all this experiment, for instance, looking at uh, you know, the X-rays or gamma rays coming from galaxies, looking at producing this dark matter at colliders and this, through this, you know, what is called direct detection, you're trying to find what is dark matter. So when we do our mm -hmm. theories, we actually make a prediction. I have a yeah. model of dark matter, okay? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I say, okay, this is my model. And so th this amount of signal you will see. Mm -hmm. So in the Large Hadron Collider, you will see this signal. In this, you know, galaxies, you will see this signal. And people go out and check this and, mm -hmm. and then they can rule out uh, different models. Okay, so I got one more question here. Yeah. So the, can dark matters give us some answers to the theory of parallel universe? Actually, yeah. So, so actually that's a very good question. So some people believe it's one of the model. It's mm -hmm. just, just like uh, in our universe, we have atoms and molecules. There is a, a parallel universe made of dark matter where there is a dark atom. So instead of an electron, there is a dark electron there. Instead of a proton, there is a, a dark proton, and people call it the twin, twin, twin universe. Mm -hmm. So there is a twin universe, mm -hmm. and that's 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 a very well motivated idea. Maybe there, there is a you know there is a dark universe, but the question is, how did why why does the dark universe exist, right? Uh, right, right. That would be yeah. very good. Yeah. Excellent. So, so but, let's see. I, I, yeah. There is one more question just came in. So maybe yeah. let me read it to you, the existence of the dark matter can be inferred only through the, its gravitational influence. Right. So we still don't have a unified theory that includes gravity. 
Right. Should we not try to understand dark matter by building such a theory rather than looking for potential candidates of dark matter? Okay, so that's, that's a very good question. The idea, if, if you talk to especially cosmologists or someone, they, they will say that you know, dark matter is detected through the uh, gravitational interaction. We have seen the evidence of dark matter through, but we are say, what we are saying, all these interactions that we showed is happening through the Higgs. So mm -hmm. this, right. this claim that uh, the dark matter only interacts through gravitation is not correct, okay? Mm, okay. So people like us, particle physicists are saying, no, 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 you, it can interact through the Higgs. It can interact through other uh, forces, okay? So that's the whole purpose of the, the particle dark matter because when I told you I work in, so this whole idea is that no, we can even detect them through uh, different forces. For instance, the force of the Higgs. And so we can actually see them in experiment because the gravity is very weak through gravitational effects. We have to really see the dark matter when we go to galaxies and all. Now, mm -hmm. if you're talking about really small objects because the gravitational force between them is so weak, we cannot detect them. Mm -hmm. But purely from uh, physics, purely from math, you can say that if there is a dark matter, it has to couple to ordinary matter. You cannot prevent it. And I we can see. detect it even at a single dark matter level. We don't have to look at the whole halo halo of you know, dark matter surrounding a galaxy. There, they're going to produce a gravitational effect because they are big enough that the gravitational effects becomes important. But if you're seeing a single dark matter, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be not. It's the same thing. I remember in, in your talk, someone asked the question is that what happens to uh, the black holes that were supposed to be produced as Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are not the macroscopic black holes. These are microscopic black holes. And these microscopic back holes have only gravity interactions. As a result, they're very weak. So these microscopic mm. black holes will go right through us. They don't do anything. To really have a big, for instance, uh, the, the gravitational waves that the, the LIGO has seen, mm -hmm. these are uh, black holes which are 30 times the mass of the sun, right? And even the okay. signal- It's the, so, the, so small, so weak. You know, small, right. right. Yeah, it's right. So right. Um, mm -hmm. actually we are close to this LIGO experiment. And, and the signal they produce is like, they change the length of, for instance, if you take the distance from here to the earth, it changes that distance by like uh, one centimeter or one millimeter. So, the, I mean, these are extremely weak. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so we cannot detect them through their gravitational interaction, but what we are saying, they also have other interactions. They have the weak interaction, they interact through the Higgs and we can actually detect them. Very good. So I, I don't know how you, um... How do you want to close it off with your presentation? Um, I, uh, so, you know, I, um, I, I want to, uh, so this is the conclusion is that uh, we know that, you know, we haven't actually detected, uh, we have seen indirect evidence of dark matter through, mm -hmm. you know, gravitational interactions. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is really study them in the lab. And we believe that, you know, the dark matter is going to couple, it's going to interact with the ordinary matter. And we'll see that. And my prediction is that you are going to see them soon. I mean, there are many, many, I mean, the, the brilliance or the ingenuity of people it, it, in particle physics, it's not only physicists they're working, they're working with engineers and all. Correct, right. And mm -hmm. so much technology is developed. Now you can actually measure the precision that is achieved is amazing. So I think it's a matter of time when we will actually observe them in the lab, just we did uh, neutrinos and we will study them. We will, the only way, because you cannot go, I mean, okay, we, we cannot really go to some galaxy and <laughs> study that. What we need to do is, you know, produce this dark matter in our, uh, in our you know, lab and really study them, right? Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we will know what it is, what are its properties, what is mass, what, you know, we will know how likely. Uh, as I said, we have this. Uh, so, so, uh, but no, so the, which basically means a really huge instrumentation, which are right. multi, multi right. you know, very large. Large, uh, large a, yeah. More a general question, you know, yes. somebody like you working in the field, uh, expert on it, you know, uh, you get access to this sort of a data collected. Or, right, right, yeah. How can someone, you know, who is uh, sitting remote in Assam, Right. And that they have some interest in it can be actually uh, getting to know this a little bit more or get to be even accessing some of the data. 
So, right. So right now, most of and the of course they can contact you. I know that. So but, absolutely, they can contact. But most of the experiment are more than happy because what I I call myself what is um, a phenomenologist, which means someone who actually works with experiment. And so when we so there is a, a big uh, collaboration. I don't do just do my theory. I always talk right. to experiment. You know. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here. What can you do? Mm -hmm. And they are very happy to share our data. Now, exactly. when- uh, That's what before, I thought. Mm -hmm. this, yes, yeah, so it is, it's, and uh, today it's, you know, we want to share with everyone. It's not that we want to share, if you are an experiment in the US, we just want to share with you. We want to share with everyone because we know that, you know, if science is to grow, we cannot just, you know, be limited to one country. It has to spread throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, uh, and everything is a collaboration. All the big experiments are collaboration. Um, because you know you have to split the work. You have to give the everyone has to uh, collaborate. So mm -hmm. all the big experiments are huge uh, international mm -hmm. collaboration, and right. you know there are there are experiments in India. Uh, there are collaborations in India. I know that work with uh, with all the big big labs. So sharing of data is you know if you have any question, I mean I want you know anyone who is interested in. Um, in contact me about any questions. If you're interested in any you know, further studies, you know, if you want some references from me, uh, please feel free to, uh, to contact me. And you know, I mean, uh, we are all supported by NSF. One of the main goal of NSF is to actually uh, do this kind of work, you know, Absolutely. to popular, right. popularize science right. and- Popularize and science and so on. Uh, right. Yep. So for that, this is our work. This is what you know we are supposed to do, right? So right. don't feel bad that you know if I ask you a question, I'll be bothered or something. No, that's mm -hmm. you know good for us. More questions, <laughs> very nice. Sir. So at some point, maybe Pop Olakawa, what we can do? At, um, maybe not today. Obviously, we didn't plan it that way. That how to access the data, get a little bit of more introductory. That sort of way to. How do people access the data? That sort of information right. we can do a different sure. session, and that I can talk from my perspective, the network connectivity, and you know, right. I know Harvey Newman at uh, Caltech very well. You probably right. know him too, right, and right, so right. he works a lot on yeah. that. Uh, there is one other last question here. Uh, yeah. That uh, I mean, you know, it's just, uh, that. What is your opinion on string theory? That's your question to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, so one of the questions that was asked is that. So we talked about the three forces, right? So uh, there is the electromagnetic force, strong force and the weak force. And people have been trying to uh, combine um, a gravity and make one force, okay? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that these three forces can actually be uh, combined. And uh, there are uh, uh, many models. And uh, one of the first famous model was by an Indian scientist and a Pakistani scientist. It was called the, the Salam, uh, Pati Salam model. So they showed that, you know. Is that Abdul Salam? That's what... Abdul Salam, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jogeshpati. Jogeshpati is from, mm -hmm. from Orissa. Uh, so, um, but gravity is a problem, right? And uh, so the first thing you have to do is now we know that to have a proper consistent theory, you actually cannot have the classical version. You have to what we call have a quantum version of the theory, okay? So every force like electrodynamics has a quantum version. That's what we actually do, it's, it's called quantum electrodynamics. So first thing we have to do is we have to take gravity and you have to quantize it, okay? And that has been a very, very difficult problem. So mathematically, and you know, people who have a mathematical background is that the equations that you have are highly nonlinear. So they are not, you know, linear mm -hmm. uh, differential equation. And uh, to quantize that becomes very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. String theory is beautiful because what string theory says is that all the different particles that we see are just different. Uh, you know, if you play a piano or something, there are different frequencies, right? So imagine there is a string which is vibrating at different frequencies. So, so what we see, the different particles are actually uh, just different uh, frequencies of the same uh, string. So the fundamental object is a string and which is vibrating at different frequencies. And at different frequencies, they look like different particles, like the electron or the quark. So they are just different frequencies. But what they found out remarkably is that it also gave Einstein's equation. Mm -hmm. So when they actually wrote a theory, so they said that even if Einstein had not done his theory of general relativity, we would have found it out because our theory actually gave Einstein's equation. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was very compelling. It was, you know, but the point is we are doing physics. Physics is you can have all these beautiful theories, but ultimately you make a prediction. We go to the lab and test it. They have not been able to make any prediction. <laughs> and, and they have like, they have, I do not know, whatever, it can be anything. So their model produces all kinds of possibilities. They have not been able to. And even if they have some prediction, by the time we have those energy to test this prediction, it's going to take a thousand years, if not, <laughs> if not more. So it has become, you know, people are attracted to it because the math is very pretty. And at some point I think, you know, math, you know, you develop math and uh, you develop math just for math. And sometimes this math is used for many other things. For instance, we use like group theory or mm -hmm. abstract algebra, which right. people develop not to be used in particle physics, but it turns out it became useful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's yeah. possible that the math that they develop will be used for you know, something. But right now, that is the biggest drawback. There are no predictions for that. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things that people say uh, in string theory, the person who is famous, Edward Witten, he's probably the smartest person. Mm -hmm. uh, but Edward Witten is not going to win the Nobel Prize because his theory doesn't have a prediction. <laughs> so he may be the smartest person in the world, but not <laughs> Mm -hmm. Less smart people have won the Nobel Prize because they yes. have a theory to make a prediction and you know you, you verify it. So, yeah. so that's that's the biggest. Okay, but so in India, you know, there is, there is I will add uh, read the last question as a follow up right. to the string question. So right. basically, in short, uh, Maxwell's four equations are enough for electrodynamics, like as right. string theory will be uh, a general theory in physics right. one day. Is that uh... absolutely absolutely? So they they will have one equation. So the ultimate thing is to have one equation which will explain everything, right? Correct. So that's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's just excellent. Very good. Thank thank you, Alakawa. It was great. Yeah. Thanks. Listening thanks to for... you. you know, I learned <laughs> yeah. a lot. I mean, my my knowledge of physics, you know, goes back to a long long time back. You know. Right. And then you know I'm picking up a physics. Uh, more recently from a different perspective because of the, with all the experimentation, large right. in collider, you are generating so much of data and right. only a very fraction of the data generated in terms of what it is, is that actually right. useful. Then it brings in, how do you measure it, uh, calculate it and how you transfer the data between right. different places right. so that, you know, uh, scientists can actually benefit from it. So, you know, exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So that's why I, 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 when I listened to your talk, it was really, so it will be of uh, great interest to our students here. Because, yeah, you know, I'll be happy to do that. Right, but so very, thank you again, Alakawa. Thank you. I thank you. I was so happy. Uh, the questions were great. And I'm just not saying it because so that's why I'm, I'm, you know, quite excited that, you know, I do not know the audience, but uh, I, I feel that people are really, you know, paying attention to all this development, and so it's it's. So, nice so what to... I will do, Polakavo, uh, is that, you know, all the uh, questions in the chats gets yeah. recorded with the recording. You know, we say right. it. I'm going to share yeah. with you. It's if some of them you want to write a short uh, response to it, then sure. since I know the mailing list of the people who signed up for the the for the webinar, I'm going right. to share with them so they will benefit, you know, from that, you know, from that knowledge. And then they can do more follow-up question with you, obviously, so. Absolutely. So again, please feel free to contact me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I said, this is, uh, this is part of our job. So this is what we have to do. Right. Exactly. So, right. so don't, don't be shy or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, thanks, thank, thank you again. Thank you very much. And thanks thank everyone and, for joining today. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we'll be in touch and well, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Let's okay. See. I'm going to stop the recording. So.